All right, before we get started, just to remind everybody that we do have a Patreon that you can use to support the show. We've got three tiers. The first one gives you early access and ad-free versions of the show. That includes cutting out annoying ads, such as this one for the Patreon. Uh, the second tier gets you all the bonus content in addition to that. And the third one also lets you vote on upcoming topics. So that's right. You get to choose topics like this one today, which actually there was a vote and it was dead even between this and the Summerton man. So we had decided just to do both because I wasn't quite sure how to resolve that. But anyways, our fans on Patreon did choose this topic for us. <laughs> what's our, what's he doing? One of our cryptids is being silly. All right. Anyways, let's get to the show. It's time for the Alien Conspiracy Podcast. We are your hosts, Agent ETA, Agent Ether, and Agent Anderson. Come along as we examine UFO sightings, conspiracies, and all things strange. You can follow the show on Twitter at AlienConPod. We also have an email address, AlienConPod at ProtonMail.com. We would love to hear from you. And don't forget to check out all of our other wonderful links in the description. Look for the link tree. It's got everything under there. This week's episode, The Allagash Abductions. We don't do too many abductions. I think the only one we've actually done so far is the Betty and Barney Hill. That's the only one I can remember. So Is that the only one? Yeah. I feel like we've done one more. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, you might be right about that, actually. Oh, no, no, no. We did Travis Walton as well. So we've done two. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to get on it, man. There's a ton of these things. We've, we've barely touched on them at all. We got to start talking about these. They're creepy, hey, we though. Got, we got time. Yes, they are pretty creepy. I mean, if you just picture yourself in that situation, not a fun time, you know? I could see oh, no. just a plain UFO sighting. Like, you're just chilling in your backyard, drinking some beers, flipping some burgers, and you can see, you know, a V-shaped formation fly overhead. That's a good time. You get excited, something to talk about at the water cooler the next day mm -hmm. or whatever. But, you know, yeah, getting, ab yeah. getting abducted and getting probed, no thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know? I don't know. I, I don't want to be like George St. Pierre where he's talking about like, oh, I am laying down in my bed and sometimes I have missing time. And like, <laughs> you know, the, the, well, mostly that's uh, my reaction to that is like, did you go to sleep, George? Yeah, that... That might be Matt Sarah's fault too. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could be possible. Yeah, <laughs> but who knows? Maybe, maybe. Well, they, you know, we talked about it before, but he did see a UFO, and we do have corroborating witnesses, which is pretty crazy. You know, like yeah. witnesses that might normally not want to corroborate because they're you know public figures. But all right, uh -huh. let's get to the show. So we're talking about the Allagash abductions. This one happened way back in August of 1976. Four friends. Now, um, I, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to encourage ETA to comment on these names. <laughs> but we have oh, sure. yeah. some of the some of the best names ever in one of our case files. So first of all, we have Jack Weiner. <laughs> first of all, like, what's wrong with his parents? Yeah, exactly. You know, like I've heard the name pronounced two different ways, Weiner and Weiner, but I prefer Weiner, of course, you know. Yeah, of course. But not, not like that, though. Not like that. <laughs> <But> like, uh, <laughs> God damn, that came out wrong. <laughs> but, but what's wrong with his damn parents, man? I, I bet he, he must have been, like, uh, messed with in school and shit. Yeah. Hey, Jack, <laughs> did you mess with your Weiner this weekend? <laughs> That's worse I'm than sure a boy named Sue. <laughs> I know, right? That's way worse. Yeah, uh, I mean, you're gonna get you're gonna get messed with, like, as a kid for sure, at, at the very least, and as an adult, probably likely too. Like, yeah, when well, you introduce yourself to to somebody, hey, how's it going, sir? What's your name? Uh, Jack Weiner. <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that must have happened to him at yeah. one point or many points in his life. I would have to uh, uh, name or I have to assume. But then uh, Allagash is kind of a weird, weird. Uh, you know, a weird name for an area also. Like, I, I, I remember I knew this girl, uh, you know, when I was a teenager, her name Allie, Alla, and, uh, you know, seen her gash, but whatever, you know, I mean, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All righty then. <laughs> so anyways, Jack Wiener and his porn brother named, uh, his porn star named brother Jim Wiener. I think those are both good porn names right there. Jack and Jim Wiener. <laughs> they're um, a little straight into the point, but yeah, th- yeah, it'll do. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're only the, the third wheel here, the poor dude without a porn star named Charlie Filtz. I guess that, that actually sounds kind of pornish. You know, Filtz sounds like a dirty sex act, I suppose. Um, and, and Chuck Rack, somehow Chuck Rack sounds like a good porn name too. So this, these guys were in the woods. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Chuck's a, Chuck's a boob man, you know, yeah. you can give less of a shit about the ass, but he's a boob man. You know, that's, yeah. that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. These guys were in the woods minding their own business when they discovered, uh, you know, a lady with a flat tire that they, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that they had to help her fix. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> okay. okay. Anyways. So in August, 1976, Four friends, Jack and Jim Wiener, who are twins, by the way, Charlie Filtz and Chuck Rack, left Boston, Massachusetts and headed out to the Allagash River in Maine for a camping trip. Their plan was to canoe, fish, frolic, and camp along the river. So it's it's a river with a series <laughs> of lakes on it. I kind of looked up the map because of one of the things in the case I'll talk about later. But the map is sort of like this river with periodic lakes. Some of them look quite large. So their idea was to sort of paddle up and down this river. And there's a town named Allagash. And from what I could tell, uh, back then, you actually had to fly to the area that they went to because it was it's that remote. So they're they're in a very, very remote area in, in the wilderness in Maine. And if you look at a map, you can see there's... Not a whole lot there. It's kind of the middle of nowhere. Well, it's just hard I to actually, get to is what I yeah. saw that it's just hard to get to. I actually read, yeah. I read that back then, um, the town of Allagash was only populated by 277 people. Yeah. That's also something, yeah, somewhere, yeah, very, very few people there. Yeah. Very small. Well, I mean, how, you can't even get there. <laughs> how are you going to live yeah. there, you know? So they they started off they made their way to telos lake i guess is where they began their journey their fishing and their frolicking and they started off the, whoa my notes suddenly skipped to page 7 that's weird hold on sorry i got to scroll back hmm. up here you have notes yes i do <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm joking <laughs> i have 11 pages of condensed notes here Let's see if we get through all oh, this wow. stuff um, nice let's see so okay sorry now we're back on page 1 here we go Okay, so they were doing their thing, you know, canoeing and canoodling or whatever they're doing out there in the woods. And on the second night of their trip, Jim noticed a strange light in the sky, a strange bright object. They This time they were actually at a sort of a busier campground. There was other people around and they saw it too. So everybody saw it, I guess. I don't know. They uh, Jim was actually able to see it through binoculars and he saw it, the object, which was floating above the treetops. Um, it was there for about 15 to 30 seconds. And he said it looked like some sort of structured craft with like a bright, like a fire or something. Did you hear this one, Ether? Ether? I heard they saw a light, but in the interview, they just said it was brief and then it disappeared. Yeah, it was 15, 30 seconds. Then it suddenly winked out from the outside edges inward is what the description is like, huh? Okay. I mean, I've seen other UFO sightings like that before but it's still a, sort of an interesting description. That's not a super common description, pretty unusual. So he hadn't had, and I saw a quote, he had an odd feeling that the object wasn't quite right. <laughs> yeah, I bet I I'd no. probably, I'd probably feel that way myself. <laughs> so they're going about their business, you know, and on the fourth day they set up camp at Eagle Lake and they're going fishing or, you know, I guess they're getting low on provisions or maybe they just want to catch some fish or whatever. So they're fishing on the lake and they decide to do some nighttime or evening fishing after dark. And as they're doing this, it's, they're getting ready. It's pitch blackout. Like one of the interviews, I think he said he couldn't see his hand in front of his face or something like that. It's like really, really dark out. Remember, this is in the middle of nowhere. So if there's no, you know, if there's no moon out and there's clouds or whatever, probably you can't see anything. So they built a fire back at camp so that they could find their way back. And they built like a big giant bonfire. It wasn't like a little tiny fire. It was a big giant fire. They said some of the mm-hmm. logs they used were like 10 inches, 10 inch logs, like 10 inches across or something. So big giant logs. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Jack 
Wiener was using <laughs> was a big, yeah. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a big old Lincoln Logs. Or am I? Anyways, they went out, to, went out onto the water and while they were fishing, they weren't, they were not on the water for very long when Chuck started feeling as if somebody was watching them. He looked around searching the darkness and he saw a large, bright sphere of colored light hovering motionless and soundless about two to 300 feet above the trees to the southeast. He told his friends to look at the light, and they all saw it. It was coming up from behind the trees, I guess. Um, well, I, I guess those are two conflicting descriptions. Which was it? Was it 200 feet above the trees, or was it coming up? Well, I think what they meant was when he first saw it, it was coming up from from behind the trees, and then it stopped and hovered 200 feet above the that trees. That was my understanding. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote that mm. down weird. <laughs> so it, they all said that it looked like the same object that they had seen on the second night, or two nights previous. They described it as having a gyroscopic motion to its surface, the surface appeared to be made of energy and had a rolling boil look. It had four distinct areas of color that melted into each other. And here's a quote. It had this roiling effect to it. And like a miniature sun, very, very bright. It lit the treetops up like daylight and it was absolutely silent. Is that kind of more or less the description you guys ran across? Not in so oh, yeah. much detail, though. That's very detailed. Oh well, not not initially, and this is kind of one of the things, and we'll talk about this later. But like uh, the different interviews with these guys and the, the information that they state over, like uh, it started out simple their story. And I, then, agree. Like, uh, I agree. I agree. They started adding more and more to it. It seems, or maybe they, maybe maybe they weren't adding more and more to it. Uh, you could take this either way. You know what I mean? Either they were adding yeah. more and more to well, it, getting some, more elaborate it, with their story, the interview, or they were just they were just remembering more maybe over time, you know? Interviews can be tricky because it depends on what questions are asked, how the questions are asked, and how the interviews are edited together, you know? Yeah. If oh, you, yeah, yeah. If you see them on a show like um, Unsolved Mysteries, for example, they were on that show, uh, or at least they did the case. I don't know if all four of them were on that show. I did not watch the episode but they did a show about it and a show like that, it's an hour format and quite often they'll have different segments. So this segment might only be 10 minutes long. So they're going to edit the accounts and the accounts are going to be much shorter than if you watch a documentary dedicated to this. And I don't know, there's, that is definitely a red flag. We can talk, maybe talk about it a little bit more later, but it's not necessarily proof of anything or another, but it is definitely worth mentioning. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point in the encounter, Charlie pointed his flashlight at the object and turned it off and on to signal a, like an SOS signal. And when he did this, the object stopped rising or, you know, whatever it was doing and moved towards the canoe. Yeah. And I, I find that kind of weird because like, like in hindsight, maybe for them, if this is a real event, you know, then uh, they basically just like flag the UFO down and say, hey, come abduct us. You know? Right. Hey. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know? And there's... There's a couple of cases, which I won't get into, but there are a handful of cases where people signal the UFO and they get abducted. So, you know, <laughs> I guess uh, community service nope. notice. <laughs> yeah, note to self. If Don't. ever in the forest and see a shining light above treetops, do not draw attention to yourself. Maybe duck and cover. Mm -hmm. Don't point lights at it. Don't shoot it with your gun. Just, you know, just hide behind a tree let it go and it might just leave you alone. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't try, don't try. There's all, yeah, there's other cases where people will see a UFO and they try to shoot it with a gun. It's like, what the hell's wrong with you? What are you doing, buddy? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it stopped and it moved towards the canoe. And as it did so, a tube shaped beam of light came down from the object as it approached. The guys in the canoe started getting pretty scared at this point and they started to paddle back to shore, you know, like, Oh shit, let's go. You know? So they just started paddling, you know, for, you know, dear life, I suppose. And uh, of course, <laughs> the object caught up to them and they were enveloped by the light. The next thing Charlie remembered was dragging himself from the water onto the shore. And they were, you know, at the shore in front of the camp. And he walked up to the camp and he found Jack and Jim already there. They watched the object as it moved away. Chuck was still in the canoe in a trance, staring at the object. He suddenly woke up from the trance and joined the others. And um, the twins had a slightly different remembrance. Like they remembered a little bit more of the event. They, they also leapt forward in time, 
you know, as far as like them, the UFO being above them, and then all of a sudden they're at the shore. But they also remember seeing the object hovering for 20 to 30 feet above the water, its beam of light still shining down on the surface of the lake before it left. And, um, or I guess, so yeah, it was doing that, it was hovering 20 to 30 feet above the water, and it hovered there for five minutes, totally silent before it left, I, I should say. So they remember that little added detail, but other than that, it's pretty much the same thing. So when it left, the light pointed up, the object rose slowly for a short time, and then shot straight up and was gone in just a second, and sort of blended in with the other stars, according to some accounts. Other other accounts you see, it just shot off, and it was gone, just like that, mm -hmm. which is pretty typical. We've seen a lot of uh, witness statements of other UFO sightings where the UFO behaved in this way. So they yeah. noticed at the camp that their fire which had just been burning bright moments ago was now completely burned out with just a few embers left smoldering. Now there should have been enough logs on the fire to burn for at least two or three hours, or at least they said, and yet there were only, they were only gone for 20 minutes and the fire was out somehow, which is sort of a strange detail, but they didn't think much of it. They just sort of went to bed, which is another strange detail because normally if something like this happened, you know, I would be up all night. I don't think I'd even be able to sleep if I saw something like that hovering over oh, my yeah. canoe. I I definitely wouldn't be able to sleep. I can tell you that. But they just got, they just sort of were in a trance, it sounds like, and they just sort of went to sleep. To me, it kind of sounds like uh, if they were abducted, then the um, the aliens that did abduct them, maybe they used some kind of mind-altering device or chemical, whatever it is, you know, something like that, something to help them forget or make them more docile, something like that, you know? Oh yeah. Which is, which is a recurring, uh, you know, thing that you hear <laughs> when, with, uh, abduction cases, you know, where the person doesn't necessarily remember, you know, the, the, the event until well after the event, you know, and some, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I mean, there's so many different cases that, you know, that there's, there's varying different levels of that kind of information, but it seems to be a common one with a lot of people that, they don't remember it right away. They just remember like the time had passed and, you know, they, they kind of look at it as something that was, was very fishy or odd, but they can't quite put their finger on what happened, you know, which kind of sounds yeah. like that's what happened here. For sure. Yeah. Agent Ether, any comments so far on the uh, sighting I'm event? Fixing my... She's distracted. Thing. All right. So the next day they reported it, the sighting to a park ranger and the ranger said it was probably caused by searchlights at the grand opening of a hardware store in the town of Millinocket. <laughs> and I looked this up on the map, and on the map, it looks like it's roughly 60 miles away. I just kind of ballparked it. Yeah. I found the I found that. Eagle Lake on the map in Maine, and it's it's pretty far. It's nowhere near Eagle Lake. There's there's yeah. no way. There, I mean, it's just completely silly. I think the park ranger didn't know what to think of it. He's like, ah, it's probably just the searchlights, you know, because he probably uh -huh. saw the searchlights, I guess. I don't know. But I mean, I've seen searchlights hitting the clouds and stuff before. It can look unusual. It can even look pretty weird, but oh yeah, it ain't going to look like what these people described, <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. So they continued their camping trip for 10 more days, give or take, I guess. And they didn't see the object again. They went home and lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the end. <laughs> and that's the case file, guys. It's a short one this week. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> of course, if that was all there was to it, we wouldn't be talking about it. But they, so it, they, it it goes on from there. It, but twelve. But it doesn't continue until twelve years later. After the sighting, they did mention it to friends and family, but nobody believed their account. It was twelve years later, though, that they actually started reporting it to what 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 actually happened to them and something led into this. Okay. It wasn't just sort of random. Jim was injured in a fall that resulted in like epilepsy or seizures. So you got like a head injury. He, he broke his back too. Yeah. yeah. From what I understand. Yeah. It's, it was a bad accident. He fell for, he fell from like 14 feet or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He went to a friend's house. I guess he used to be an electrician's apprentice and he was going to look for a fuse box, so he opened up a door. He was like a closet door, and he thought the fuse box was in there. And it led to a basement, but there were no stairs. Wow. So he fell, and he landed like in a seated <laughs> position. And it drove like his, I guess it's a, he said it drove his brainstem up into his skull and broke his back. Uh. 
And then ever since then, he'd had problems with uh, with epilepsy. Yeah, that's yeah. messed up, man. Seizures and stuff, and yeah. Hey, if you don't got Sounds stairs, like one. if you don't got stairs in your basement, put a sign or something. You know, that's that's messed up, right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So after this injury, he began to have nightmares about the camping trip. And here's a quote, for example, he'd say, there's, there's a lot on this, but one short quote is, he said, there were always certain elements of the dream that were the same. Some type of creature being helpless, being violated was a feeling I often woke up with. And his twin brother, mm-hmm. Jack, he talked about it a little bit with Jack and Jack also had started to have similar nightmares. And some people think that this might, there might be some kind of weird twin connection going on here. Which it's it would be easy to dismiss, but as we've talked about on a previous episode, I think spooky stories, like we've had some strange experiences ourselves, so I'm not ready to dismiss that outright. It's possible, I suppose, even though it seems very weird. But so his brother Jack did have some nightmares as well, and here's a quote from him. I was starting to have nightmares, really terrible nightmares that I could not explain. I found myself in a very brightly lit room. I had no idea where I was or why I was there. To my left, I could see my brother Jim, Chuck Rack, and Charlie Foltz sitting on some type of bench, and they were all naked. I was wondering why they weren't helping me, because I felt like I was in danger, and while I'm trying to figure this out, I noticed this figure, or a dark, shadowy-type figure emerging from this light, this bright light in front of me. I would wake up sweating and breathing heavily and just just in a state of terror and shock sometimes jim would wake up at night surrounded by these creatures he would see them surrounding him he would be paralyzed during this encounter and sometimes he would be levitated off of his bed so that's one of the things about this case is that jim reported well actually three of the witnesses actually reported encounters after the event and Jim reported them actually going back to his childhood. His doctor at the time was somewhat familiar with UFO cases, Jim's doctor. And he suggested Jim actually go see like a lecture by UFO researcher Ray Fowler, which was in May of 1988. So the four friends went and they, they had been talking about this and how, you know, they were sort of talking about the UFO experience, which they hadn't discussed in years, I guess. So they they went and Jim talked to Ray and told him about their encounter in the missing time. MUFON investigator David Webb and hypnotist Tony Constantino also got involved with the investigation. So one thing led to another and they all did separate regressive hypnosis section, sessions. So they were not in the se- sometimes they'll do these like in a group setting or you'd be in the same room, but they separated them and did it did it by themselves to try to see if they would come with the same story, basically. And you can actually find this transcripts of this. I'm not sure if they're online. I didn't really look for them because, um, you know, it would be a lot to read on the show. I looked for them. Did you find them? No, I was really sad. I even went to the Wayback Machine. They're actually in a book, though. Okay. So you can find those in a book. And Are are you talking about the... Because you you cut out there for a second for me. So are you talking about the... uh, like all of them, like like uh, if they're if they have like a website or something like that. No, I didn't see a, I didn't see a website that they all have. But no, I was talking they, about their, they do. As a matter of fact, and they also sell uh, paintings and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me, they sell oh, paintings. Do they? And, um, I didn't yeah, see about that. The, uh, the abduction and stuff. Yeah. What's the website? Uh, I saw it on. Uh, I I didn't I didn't write it down because <laughs> I didn't think it was wait, that wait, important. I, got really. it. I, was, I was just all. Alagash UFO Twins dot com, but I don't think it's up anymore. I think it, oh I, yeah oh really no. I, okay I did I didn't go on the site I saw I that uh, yeah. reading that they had one I, I went, saw that I went website. to the Wayback Machine and I looked at that site specifically so you can view their artwork which is yeah. which is cool you can see all their like paintings and drawings and photo photography and there's some like pottery yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw that link. I clicked on it, but yeah, the website was not up anymore, unfortunately. So yeah, mm, I did. Okay. I did see that one. So, but unfortunately, yeah. So that yeah, that was. Uh, so anyways, let's see. They went to where was I? Uh, yes, yeah, so they went and had the regressive hypnosis. And when they did so, they remembered details of the night that they hadn't caught before. So the one when, when uh, the story starts again, let's say when they're in the canoe, and when the beam of light hit them. 
they were enveloped by it and it seemed like a hollow glass tube it's sort of you know was sort of surrounding them it transferred them to the object above and when i looked at the statements on transferred like did they float and they sort of described it as more of like a teleportation or something it's weird but once they were on the ship they saw strange humanoid creatures with big heads and big eyes basically you're gray aliens although if you look at their artwork some of them are um quite terrifying <laughs> they're not they're not mm-hmm. your cute little gray aliens they're your oh shit nope. gray aliens yeah <laughs> <laughs> your, your nightmare fuel aliens so i have a couple of quotes here from from a couple of the witnesses about their experience like i said i'm not going to go through all of the transcripts because it'd be quite a lot but here's what jack weiner said <laughs> They're right here. Oh, Jack. Their face is right in my face. I don't know why. I don't want to know. I don't want to know what they want. They're saying things in my head. They're saying, don't be afraid. They say, do what we say. Just do what we say. And then Charlie Foltz said, it's like a doctor's office. I get that. It's cold like a doctor's office is cold. They put the panel over your chest. Then they scrape your arms and your chest, your legs and thighs. We shouldn't be here. I just... I just keep thinking, I want to be back in the canoe. And here's another quote. Chuck saw what was done to Charlie. Um, or and this is a quote uh, by Chuck. He was, as he was watching what was being done to Charlie. I see some sort of device on him. They've got, uh, this looks like a silvery. It looks like the, it's got curves on it. It's almost like, like it sucks something. He's got his head tipped way back. It's almost like he's in pain. We can't help him. All we can do is watch him. So that's what Chuck said about that. Mm-hmm. While they were and on, didn't he say? Yeah, didn't he say like they're they were like manipulating his joints and stuff, or is is that somebody else's quote? Like they were manipulating his body and stuff, and like I remember him saying, I think it was him that that uh, said like if they keep on doing this, they're gonna hurt him real bad. Like he was very worried about what they were doing to him. You know? Yeah, yeah, I did see that one. Yeah. So while they're on the ship, um, when they first got there, Charlie looked down and saw the canoe on the lake below them empty. They were told to go to a room and they weren't able to conf- to refuse as if they were under some kind of control, like they, they didn't have control over their bodies. Jack remembers a weird instrument with a scoop on the end. And uh, Jim watched as they examined Jack. I guess Jack was up first. They used a thin rod with a light on it to examine his body from like head to toe, like his eyes and everything. And they inserted an object into his penis, apparently to extract sperm. <laughs> it's a, that could be a good time, good you know? Bodily fluids. Yeah. yeah. And then Jim was up next and uh, he felt strongly like he had to take off his clothes the way he described it. Um, it's So it wasn't like they were controlling his body. It almost sounds more like like a compulsion of some kind. It's weird. Like, I don't know. Um, so he was examined just like his brother was. And then the other two were next. Uh, Chuck remembers seeing um, a machine embedded in Charlie's chest, which is like, that doesn't sound like that's a good time. weird. Yeah. That's kind of weird. Oh no. Yeah. So sounds they, like some anime stuff. Yeah. So they took samples of, you know, bodily fluids, skin scrapings, um, you know, saliva, blood, that kind of thing. And then when they were done with the examinations, they were led to a room with a portal or tube in it. And then they went through it one at a time and they had to pass through like sort of a membrane as they described it. Jack said it was as if he was running through something thick and it made him feel like he was coming apart. He saw bright images in his mind. He saw little pieces of things, little pieces of threads and things coming towards him. And here, here he says, As a quote, I see myself coming towards myself like a mirror. I can see my face and I'm screaming and my eyes are open real wide and my mouth is open real wide and my tongue is sticking out and my ears are coming off. (laughs) The hell does that mean? That's crazy. That's kind of crazy. It's like, it's like they're being teleported or something. It's weird. I don't, I I don't even know how to, it's weird. I don't know. I don't know what to even think about that. Yeah, one of them said they felt like they were being ripped apart on a molecular level. Yeah. They described it as being such an unpleasant feeling, like it felt like death. Well, what's wrong with the parachute? (laughs) (laughs) You got to get back to the canoe, you know? Sometimes low-tech is better. Uh, So that that was briefly what happened in the um, 
in the UFO, you can find lots and lots of more accounts of what happened in there, you know, more further details and stuff. I don't know. What, what did you guys hear about the examinations or anything like that? You guys got more to say on that? Well, I mean, I mean, you pretty much covered everything I've heard about it. I mean, it's, yeah. I actually watched a bunch of interviews like on YouTube and they were with like local news stations. And then there was one uh, called sightings. They all looked pretty old like from the 80s and 90s but uh they were in the actual interviews with the uh with the uh, abductees mm-hmm. but like agent ETA was saying i felt like every time they told the story it was a little different but not a little different in a way that made sense mm. you know yeah, like it's not like it's not like they were like like uh, having contradictory stories, but like when, when I was listening to those interviews, it seems like a little bit was added on each time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. And like in one part, Agent Anderson was saying that they didn't talk about it when they got back to the campsite. But then during an interview, one of the abductees said that's all they could talk about was hmm. speculating what happened to them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I did not see that account, but that is very interesting if that's, you know, if they said that in an interview. And I guess Chuck said uh, when they when they saw the light and it was up in the sky, he said something like, that's a heck of a case of swamp gas. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. <laughs> 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 that, that is, uh, yeah, still to this day a somewhat famous saying. I think people are aware of the saying more so than they are where that even comes from, you know? <laughs> but yeah, but that made me suspicious too, because did, did he really think it was swamp gas? It's just kind of a weird comment to make. Yeah. Although this is a lot closer to the swamp gas sightings. This was in 10 years, 10 years after the swamp gas sightings. So it was probably still in the pu- public consciousness a lot more when it happened. I suppose. So it's, yeah, you know, who knows? Yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the other, like, uh, well, I guess there was a, cu- a couple different, like, contradictory things, you know. Um, but, like, uh, the, the first uh, explanation that I heard, or the first uh, dis- description of, like, the wand or, like, the instrument that the aliens were using, you know, um, was sh- described as, like, a kind of like a, had, like, a needle end, or it was, like, you know, it, you know, it was, like, a, a wand with, like, that, that tapered down to, like, a sharp end or something like that. And then I heard another interview with these guys that said actually it had like a bulb on the end. And so like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a little different. There's two different things. And I, I know that, uh, I forget which, which guy was it? Was it, uh, I forget. I, I think it might've been, been Jim. I don't know. I, for, I forget who, but like, well, uh, part of the problems with the it, interviews were, you know, nowadays when you're interviewing someone, you have like their name caption down below mm. and like who they are and a lot of these interviews they're older they don't have that they just have yeah these guys talking and you're like wait is that guy chuck like <laughs> wait i think that's chuck <laughs> yeah yeah it's hard but to yeah, keep I mean, straight like, uh, except so, for the two so like, uh, uh, the two brothers <laughs> i remember one of them like uh stating that they were like uh, afraid that like you know that you know they're, they're gonna cut cut them open with that that wand or whatever but if it had a bulb on the end of it then why would you be afraid of them cutting you open with that? Because it's not like a sharp tip, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of yeah, a little fishy, but well, maybe they were just in a situation and they just had sort of fears. Who knows? Sure. Well, shit. If I was in that situation, I'd be scared out of my freaking mind, man. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, for sure. I, I'd be pissing myself if I had the option to. Which maybe the the aliens wouldn't give you that option. Maybe you know because they have you under a comatose state. You know. Right, yeah. So when they they came to, or, well, they found themselves, this is uh, um, more of the hypnosis stuff that they revealed. So they found themselves seated in the canoe, in the same spots that they were before they were taken. And they continued to the shore where they gradually came to and gained their senses and memories, you know, or they sort of came out of the trance or whatever and started to be able to remember things again, I guess you should say. Um, So another revelation came from the hypnosis is that... uh, Jim and Jack had other encounters with these beings throughout their lives. They had similar abduction encounters going all the way back to their childhood. The creatures would visit them in their bedrooms while the craft hovered over their house. And they they had experienced some paranormal things when they were younger in their house. And they had thought it was maybe ghosts or poltergeist or something like that. But then they they realized that it was actually 
no, that's just, they were rem- remembering only bits and pieces of it. And it was actually the um, abductions that were going on that was causing these memories, not actual paranormal experiences. So like, I, I'm not sure how that works. That's kind of weird. <laughs> so if you see a ghost, it might actually be an alien. I don't know. But that I don't know. It, I've always wanted to see a ghost, though. I actually, I, I'm kind of jealous sometimes, to be honest. I know that, like, maybe some people, they actually have had these experiences. Like, they, you know, they're like, why would you be jealous? But, like, no, I want to see a damn ghost. Yeah. <laughs> you know? See, I saw interviews after the uh, hypnotic sessions. Uh-huh. And the twins stated that, you know, their lives really changed after this abduction. And they describe different, well, I'll talk about it later. They describe different ways in which their their lives changed because they encountered these aliens. So it doesn't make sense to me that they would have childhood abductions, but after this abduction, then, yeah. then their lives suddenly changed. Right. Why? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Why would they... Yeah. Why their lives change if they've been abducted their whole lives, basically? Right, right. Yeah. So there's one account I found, for example, that um, they said. So they they said that they had been abducted not just before, but also after this account. And on May twentieth, nineteen eighty eight, for example, Jack woke to the sound of his dog scratching on the downstairs door. He went down to have a look. He went into the kitchen, which was lit up from outside by a bright bluish white light. He opened the front door and saw a blue glowing object hovering in the field across from his house. He got his dog and went back inside. Um, that's what he remembers, but under hypnosis, he w- remembered a couple of extra things. So after he opened the door, he walked towards the light, took a couple of steps, but then he turned back and went inside and brought his dog with him. I guess the dog was maybe outside with him, closed the door behind him and went back upstairs and got into bed. He pulled the covers over his head and his wife's head and he felt like the, you know, somebody was in the house. Now, I would just like to point out that um, despite what uh, conventional wisdom may suggest, covers are not actually protection against anything. (laughs) So if you guys are ever in a scary situation, uh, maybe pull a gun out. Yeah. Find a closet to hide in. (laughs) I don't know. The covers, that's a little obvious. You know, people are going to be able, whatever is attacking you, whether it's a Bigfoot or an alien or just a, you know, run of the mill burglar, they're going to find you (laughs) under those covers, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. So anyways, the covers start to slide down from his head all by themselves, apparently. And he saw several creatures with big eyes and big heads standing over the bed. The creatures. He turned towards his wife and saw a creature approaching her. They received mental commands, sort of like how they had on the camping trip. And they were told to walk towards the light and were powerless to stop themselves. They walked outside and they saw a huge house-sized glowing object hovering over their yard. It had a beam of light coming from the bottom, which changed color from white to orange and yellow. They walked into the light and were transferred onto the craft, again, just like on the camping trip. They were separated and examined, sort of like how they were before, with samples taken and, taken and all that kind of stuff. After the ordeal, they were floated back to their house and then they went to bed sort of like during the camping trip they just sort of were in a daze you know despite how horrible this must have been they just sort of went to sleep um and you know you know you know one thing that kind of like uh i've always wondered about uh is like how many damn samples do aliens need to take (laughs) you know what i mean i mean with all the different uh, like abduction stores that i've i've uh you know, read about or, or watched a video about it, what have you. At what point do, you know, do they learn whatever they're trying to learn? You'd think if they're that advanced and, and stuff, you know, you know, if they're studying humans or what have you, then how many damn samples do they need to take? Well, at, it, what, at what, you know, we can, at what point are they done with the research? You know, let's, let's go out on a limb here and assume that these accounts are all truthful. It could be something as simple as that we change over our lifetime. We change quite a lot physiologically as children, you know, as adolescents, adults, as elderly, like we change significantly over our lifespan. So that alone could explain them collecting different samples just to, just to investigate and track that, just to sort of check it out to see what's going on there. You know, maybe they don't age, maybe they haven't aged for a very long time. So they no longer even understand that what aging is really. So they just want to sort of you know, 
just sort of uh, research it, basically. So that's, I mean, there's any number yeah. of possible explanations, but I do definitely see what you're saying. <laughs> they would, mm-hmm. they would probably know what aging was, and it, it does seem a little silly for them to keep. Yeah. But I mean, this is something that you do that does pop up. You know, multiple abductees. Uh, maybe we should do some more abductions and sort of ex- explore that a little bit more. But it does happen, or at least a lot of people report it. <laughs> you know. Um, but in this case, uh, Jack received burn marks to the bottom of his feet. And he also had a scoop mark on his ankle as if some flesh had been removed. So that, that was sort of the end of that one as far as I had in my notes. And um, it's, it's different because the last one, they didn't seem to have any lasting injuries. But this time he's got like a scoop missing and he's got uh, burns on his feet. And it's not too clear where those burns came from on his feet. All right. We got some more stuff to talk about, but before we do that, it's time for another advertisement. Oh boy. All right. Do you like t-shirts? Well, have I got something for you? (laughs) We have, we have alien conspiracy t-shirts. Check out our T public store. You can get t-shirts, hoodies. They have them in both men's and women's styles. Some of the designs we've put on different things like stickers and phone cases and stuff like that. So take a look link in the description. All right. That's a short I'm wearing one. my t-shirt right meow. Oh yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm wearing a sweater cause I'm cold, but I have a t-shirt. I, I, have, I have two. I've actually. Ma- I made it a, I made it a tradition. Every time I record now I'm wearing the t-shirt. Nice. I should do that too. Although my, my Chromebook that I use for taking notes actually does have uh ACP stickers on it. Cause I got a couple stickers. So there's that. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but all right. Well, that was a, a short ad, but let's get back to it. Okay. So that's, that's all I had about the basic experience. And then there's tons more to talk about, but what do you guys have anything you wanted to mention in, in general? Anything agent ETA? Uh, I mean, I, not a whole lot more than that, to be quite honest. Uh, I mean, we, we've talked about the majority of everything I've taken notes on. We haven't talked about the uh, polygraph. Okay. Let's talk about the polygraph. Let's talk about oh, that's the right. polygraph. Let's do it. Okay, so I guess they went and they wanted to, I don't know if they wanted to like convince people or if it was the, uh, if it was the person they were seeing, the the specialist, what is it, Ray Fowler wanted them to do yeah. it. Yeah, that was a, the, one of the UFO researchers, yeah. Somebody said they should go do it. So they went and they saw Ernest Ride Reed and he was actually, uh, he used to work for the FBI. And he then was working for, I guess, the Massachusetts Police Department. And he went on to give them separate polygraph tests, and they all passed independently. Yeah. And, and he said it was very unlikely that all four of them, you know, would, would pass. And, and if they were all lying, that one of them wouldn't, you know, fail the polygraph test. So it was his opinion they either were telling the truth or they thought they were telling the truth. Yeah. Although I always take that with a grain of salt. We've talked about the polygraph before on the show or the psychophysiological detection of deception test. And it turns out even the guy who created it came out and said, yeah, this test is kind of bullshit and you should definitely not be using it for anything. (laughs) The, The reason why it's not allowed in the court of law is it's determined that really all it's good for is maybe coercing somebody into giving you a confession because they're afraid that it might actually work, but it doesn't actually work, or at least it not to a hundred percent. It is possible to beat. And I did, I actually saw an article um, in the news one time about there was somebody offering courses on how to beat the polygraph and the government shut them down, which I'm surprised yeah. the government did because I, that's not illegal. Is it? it like they shut them down as if it was like an illegal oper- operation, but huh. But I mean, it is beatable. The test is 100% beatable if you want to beat it. So well, because well, it, it, it measures three different things, right? Um, the rate of your breath, your heart rate, and like a uh, perspiration. So if, if you're breathing evenly and consistently, you'll be able to control your heart rate and then in turn control your, your perspiration too, right? Yeah. And so you might not even have to worry about that if you rehearse your story enough you might be able to say it as if you believe it. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Convince yourself. Yeah. I think there's a couple of different ways of saying it or to, of beating it, but it is, I mean, it's interesting. 
because well, I, so I did see an episode of the Mythbusters where they tried to beat the polygraph and they were unable to, right? But they didn't put a whole lot of effort. They have a you know they had a schedule to stick to, so it's not like they could practice it for months on end or whatever. And yeah, it, so it's not. I'm not going to say the test is completely worthless, but I am going to say that I always take that with a grain of salt. It doesn't necessarily prove anything, although it is interesting, you know. Yeah. Well, I've heard of people using like forms of meditation in in order to control themselves, you know, mm-hmm. and and that coupled with like uh, you tr- convincing yourself that what you're telling is true could definitely, you know, fool the test. Yeah. You know. What do you think about what do you think about the polygraph, Agent Ether? I actually don't know much about polygraphs, except I used to go to the gym with someone who, um, I don't know exactly what his job was, but he would he would go after like pedophiles and make mm-hmm. them take polygraph tests as mm-hmm. part of his job. That was part of his Weird. job. Yeah, so they were used, I'm not exactly sure how or in what capacity, but I know it was law enforcement. And they use them. So, oh. I mean, they relied on them. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not admissible in court as evidence. So, they probably used it to, to, to get them to confess, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I, had to take, I had to take a polygraph one time for, a, uh, you know, applying for a job. Oh. And uh, I, can tell you, I can tell you that, like, when I was sitting in the lobby right there, like, waiting to take the polygraph, all of a sudden I remembered all sorts of stupid <laughs> shit that I did, you know, that I didn't, I didn't mention. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, oh, shit, I forgot about that. But I still went through the polygraph and I still passed it. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I I didn't react to anything from what I was told. So I was I was like, all right, well, <laughs> okay then. You yeah. Know? <laughs> it was, was kind of my response. Like, you know. Yeah. It was, it was weird. But yeah. Yeah. And they, uh, yeah, the federal government, I'm pretty sure still uses it for certain things, you know, for job interviews, for certain positions and stuff. So it's still in use to this day. It's just. Um, you may be questionable. I don't know. All right. So in mm. two, in 2015, Chuck rack sort of had a falling out with the rest of the group. And he came out and said that the UFO sighting was real, but the abduction was all bullshit. He said that he went along with the story because he wanted to make money. But, um, so what he said was, uh, I don't call it a hoax, just brilliant storytelling. It's not the truth but I have to admire the storytelling ability of these guys. However, um, well, okay. So actually rack also claims that they were on drugs specifically Afghan temple ball. <laughs> have you guys the heard? Hell of, is that? Have you guys heard of the is Afghan like some kind of, temple ball? Is, it, is that some, is that, uh, what, did you, what did you say? Nipple ball temple, Afghan <laughs> temple ball. T E M P L. Oh, I you said, I thought you said Afghan nipple ball. I was like, what the fuck? Like, oh, that sounds like some crazy shit right there. Intoxicating. <laughs> is, that, is, that a, is that a hallucinogen or something like that? Is that some crazy form of like mushroom or something? But, you I know, know right? I, I heard, I heard that too, that they were basically on there. They were smoking weed. Yeah. Which I don't, I don't think we would uh, give you the impression that you got abducted by aliens. You know, you, right. you stony baloney, but like. Yeah, I, I I couldn't I don't I don't like I I couldn't see that correlation. You know what I mean? Like it, it's just all right, yeah, you're stoned. Okay, cool cool story. That's not going to give you the impression that you got abducted by aliens, though. I mean, right? Maybe if you're on LSD or mushrooms or something like that, maybe right? Yeah, uh, that could be. No, I, I heard I in, in an way, interview but that not weed that you know? <laughs> his fellow abductees felt that maybe what had actually happened was that under you know, hypnotic regression, he hadn't really experienced much and he was upset about it. And so he kind of just came out and said that it was all a hoax, mostly because he just didn't have the same experience as the others, not necessarily that the others were lying. Hmm. Yeah. I wanted to be a UFO abductee <laughs> too. Well, I want him to play with my pee pee. <laughs> <laughs> Take my body bodily fluids. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so here's here's a quote from from a good old Chucky boy here. He said, I remember being on the Joan Rivers show. Joan was asking, were you guys drinking or taking drugs? Fortunately, I was sitting furthest away from her. 
Jim was right next to her and he had to field that question and lie. And I didn't have to lie. So this quote I found very interesting because he's saying here, he's pretending as if like, oh yeah, I super don't want to lie about anything, especially not about drugs. So, but here's where I think his story breaks down with this quote is because he's lying about being abducted by fucking aliens. And then he's going to be he's going to be okay with that. And then he's going to be like, Oh, but I don't want to lie about not taking drugs. Yeah. You're not making any damn sense. You were also still sitting there with everybody else. If you wanted to object, you could have objected, you know, like, yeah, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe he just felt that maybe he was a very agreeable person or something. And he didn't want to uh, put them on the spot, you know, as it were, but like, like you could have said something. If you wanted to say something that you could have said something right then and there, you know? So I don't know why you didn't. If he was so uncomfortable with lying, he wouldn't have gone along with it in the first place. It just doesn't make any sense. Sure. So that he sort of, with that quote, doesn't, again, doesn't necessarily prove anything, but it's just sort of makes him seem a little disingenuous, you know? Well, and the whole thing that's strange to me about that is nobody makes millions of dollars off of UFO sightings or being abducted. You're not going to get rich. No, nobody no. gets rich off of you. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was and a I, strange I, for, reason. You know, for, for me also, I don't necessarily trust the man because, you know, his name and also, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he's a boob man and I'm an ass man. You yeah. Know I mean, well. so like it's <laughs> a pol- polar opposites. You know what I mean? I don't trust this guy. Yeah. You know? I, I, I don't like it. So Fultz said, just, oh yeah, sorry, ETA, go ahead. No, I'm, I, no, I just, I'm just saying is all. <laughs> <laughs> so Fultz said <laughs> that all they had was one beer at uh, at the beginning of the. They brought an eight pack of beer, which I didn't even know they made eight packs. Yeah. That's like okay. <laughs> so yeah, that was kind of strange to me. Yeah. Also, I was like, what a six pack or eight pack? What the hell are you talking Maybe about? There, I've never it seen that. Was a twelve pack, but each of them had one on on the plane on the ride over. Maybe yeah, but he said that they they each had one at the beginning of the journey and on the first day. And they each had one beer on the last day and they brought their empty bottles back with them. And that's it. He says they didn't have a ton of beer. They didn't have a ton of liquor. They didn't have any drugs, nothing. That's what he claims is all they had. And I know it was in the seventies, but that doesn't necessarily mean they were high on something just because it was in the seventies, you know? (laughs) But you know what? That don't make no sense to me, man, because if you're going to go, because from what I understand, what I read originally, they were planning on like a, somewhere around like a two week uh, trip basically, right? Yeah, it was a two week trip. They didn't, they didn't end up spending that much time there. But if you, if you're planning on being there for two weeks, you're only going to bring that much beer. What? No, dude, I'm, I'm going to bring multiple 12 packs, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be drinking <laughs> damn near the whole time, you know? Well, they had to pack very lightly because they had to fly into oh, the area. They, yeah. And then they were on a canoe well, trip. They, so they were limited to how much stuff they could bring with them. You know, after, Food, water, so, so, and tents and stuff. You don't have much carrying capacity left after that. Yeah, they weren't just well, chilling on a bank. They were they were actually actively going up the the area, up the river to go fishing, yeah. which is still popular. I was looking online to see yeah. if, there, if, if there was anything going on in Allegash. What's well, a beautiful area. And yeah, there are a lot of photos and people talking about fishing tours. There's an Allegash beer, yeah. but uh, no, no mention of aliens oh, by the locals. Oh, Allegash beer is delicious. Actually, there's actually a band named Allagash too. I don't know if you guys uh, came across this uh, during your research. Did you guys hear, uh, listen to any of their music? No, I did not. Oh, dude, it's actually all right. Like it kind of, it kind of reminds me of like early Metallica almost. They, they, uh, I came across a song that was like, just like a damn near almost like 30 minutes or something, but it was actually kind of, kind of pretty badass, man. Like it's a, it's hard rock, you know? And uh, like they're 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 talking about like the whole like the, they go throughout like the, the, throughout the song they're talking about the whole abduction like uh, uh, event and stuff and it's actually kind of a, I recommend it man it's actually kind of cool you know hmm. if you're if you're into because there's there's it's kind of surprising how many bands are out there that make songs about like alien alien abductions or experiences or what have you or even like you know cryptids and stuff like that but this one is one of, it's actually kind of one of the better ones that I've heard. It's not bad, man. It's really not bad. And I actually saw on YouTube, like huh. you could look up Allagash is the name of the band and the, the song and they have, they have different songs, but like they have a song called Allagash also the, you know, the, the name of their band. 
And uh, it's a long song, but it's not bad. I'll just say it's not bad. You know, it's it's not great, but it's not bad. <laughs> I'm gonna listen to it for sure. <laughs> I have to listen to this it's now. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of all right, man. Like I, I I listened to it for a while there, and it's a long song, but it's it's uh it's not bad. I enjoyed it. You know, nice. I that's yeah. I didn't see. I did not come across the band. There's you Google Allagash, you get a lot of stuff. I didn't see the band, but I'll have to definitely check that out. Okay. Break time. If, if I had known, I would have actually tried to contact him during the week, see if I could like play an excerpt or something, you know, just for fun. Maybe yeah, at the maybe yeah. at the end of the episode or something, because I don't know. They're they're not like uh, you know the Beatles or somebody, so they they would probably appreciate the extra promotion for what it's worth, you know. Sure. Well, I think when I when I was watching the video, it like it had something like 115 likes or something like that, or so it's it's, it's obviously not like a very popular video. You know what I mean? But like, like, uh, it, it was, like I said, it, it was all right. It's a very long song, but like, uh, I had fun listening to it. Cause like I started like paying attention to the lyrics and stuff, you know? And, and uh, I was like, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. They're actually talking about like the abduction and stuff like that. And like, they're going over some of the, uh, the claims that these guys have made, you know? And like, like, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of like talking a little bit about like, uh, their perspective, like, you know, like, like what they must have been going through, what they felt, you know, like, and stuff like that. They're, 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 they're taking some liberties, mm. but like, uh, it was, it was, it was kind of cool. I was I, like, I, I first clicked on it because I thought it was like a podcast or something like that covering the topic, you know, and I, I just wanted to hear like what somebody else's opinion about this, you know, and, um, and it turned out to be a song. And I was like, oh, shit, okay, well, this is something different, you know? And I, I started, like, at first I was like, all right, I'm only going to listen to this for a little bit. And then, like, you know, I was like, oh, okay, this is actually all right, you know? Like, it's not, like like I said, it's not like, it's like great music, you know? I, it's not like, I, but it's it's all right, though. I, I enjoyed it, you know? You know, I mean, maybe I'm too much of a critic uh, when it comes to music or what have you, but it was all right, man. It was enjoyable, you know? Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I definitely have to check that out. Agent Ether has gone to, I think she's given medicine to the cryptids. Oh, it looks like she's back. All right. Well, actually just one of the cryptids. Oh, only one of them needs medicine. But all right. So back to Mr. Rack. He's a rack man. And uh, you yeah. were right to be yeah, suspicious of him. So apparently he has a violent temper and has been thrown out and banned from several UFO conventions. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> He's sort of not a nice guy, which, you know, if there's a falling out and there's the falling out is three versus one, I mean, maybe the problem is the one, not the three. I don't know. Jim, possibly Jim Wiener, the, uh, <laughs> Jim fucking, <laughs> Jim fucking Wiener. God. <laughs> hey, I'm Jim and Jack. <laughs> I personally believe that Mr. Rack's self, <laughs> this is, this is, I guess, from an email or something from Jim Wiener. I personally believe that. Mr. Rack's self-aggrandizing rationalizations and disparaging accusations are simply the rantings of an angry and resentful individual on whom his former friends have turned their backs. A little, mm -hmm. little too poetic for me, but hey, you know, whatever. Getting the point. I, I've heard him also described as a bit of a control freak, uh -huh. and like, uh, I, I guess, like the like the fact that he couldn't recall the same, you know, um, event as uh, his friends, like, made him a little like pissed off. I guess. Yeah, because he wasn't like like in the know, or you know, you know like he wasn't like a you know he he couldn't recall what they ca they could recall, not necessarily the same thing. So, or as much, so so it, it kind of pissed him off, I guess, from what I've heard. I mean, you know, it's a it'd be like if you were a control for yeah, maybe I don't know. It'd be like so let's say you're on a camping trip and uh, you're all hanging out by the fire, and you're like, okay, I got to take a leak. So you walk off to the side a little bit. You're, you're peeing on a tree or whatever, you know. And your friends are like, dude, dude, dude. And you're like, hold on, hold on, man. I'll be, can you give me, so you need 15 more yeah. seconds, you know? And you go back and they're no, like, no, come over here. They're like, dude, come over here. We're getting all, <laughs> we're getting all broke back mountain over here and shit, man. You, uh, <laughs> then, then you're not involved in stuff. And you're like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> well, no, no, no. You get, not in this scenario. You get back and you're like, oh. you're like, what's going on? They're like, dude, we just saw the strangest <laughs> shit, dude. Bigfoot just walked across our fireplace, you know, like our campground. You're like, no shit. You're like, Fuck, <laughs> I missed it. That would be just my luck. 
<laughs> well, I, I got to be honest, like, like Bigfoot is one of those things where like, to me, like, I, uh, if I were to miss out on that kind of a sighting, I'd be pretty pissed. Yeah. We like, should do another yeah, Bigfoot like, episode. Damn it. Yeah. Oh, well, shit. I mean, there's Bigfoot sightings around the world, not, not just North America, you know? I mean, there, there's, I mean, whether you want to call it Bigfoot or, or whatever multiple names that this creature may go, go by, you know? Swamp ape, the Yowie, the Almasty. There's the, a bunch of them. Yeah. Yeti, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. So uh, the the re- the UFO researcher Ray Fowler also had something to say about Chuck Rack. He said Chuck Rack did not have very detailed recall of the abduction under hypnosis as we were just saying. He is the type of person who needs to be in control. He was not happy not being able to have detailed recall of the abduction portion of the incident. Thus several years after the investigation he claimed that no one was abducted. Now that's that you guys were just talking about that, but I just wanted to re- reiterate that the researcher himself had that opinion. So we know that's one source where that's coming from. So it's not just, mm-hmm. it's not just hearsay or something, but we know an actual source for that quote. Maybe other people said it too, but that's what I found for that one. And Jim Weiner <laughs> talking about, was talking about an incident that happened before the Joan Rivers interview. He said, Charlie Fultz and I were visiting Jack and his wife, Mary, at their home in Vermont. One morning, Mr. Rack arrived at the house and declared he had a plan to make a million dollars on the Allagash case. His mm-hmm. <laughs> UFO setting. His proposal, about this too. Yeah. his proposal was that all four of us refute the professional handling of the case by Raymond Fowler, Tony Constantino, and Mufon, thereby creating controversy which was, in Mr. Rack's mind, exactly what the media and the public crave and pay for. In response to his proposal, Jack, Charlie, and I all voiced our disgust with his ethics and his proposal and announced our unanimous decision to have no further interaction with him regarding future Allagash projects. Unfortunately, we later forgave his inebriated indiscretion and appeared together on a couple of TV projects and UFO conferences but it was glaringly clear to Jack, Charlie, and I that Mr. Rack's behavior was becoming increasingly pathological. So that's just a quote about it. So, I mean, even though he did come out and say the one witness came, you know, Mr. Rack came out and said that it was all a lie. The other people came out and said, "Eh, he's kind of, you know, he's kind of just got a chip on his shoulder, you know? So there is a refutation. They, they did refute that. Refutation, is that even a word? I don't know. But they did refute that, <laughs> that it was fake, you know? So we, we do have a back and forth here. Just because one of the witnesses came out and said it was fake, we do have good reason to believe that he would have a motive to do so. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it was real, but it's just, it doesn't mean it was fake either, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, in a nutshell, I mean, that's basically all I had on the case. There's a ton, a ton on this case. There's like books and stuff. You can look up interviews. You can go on and on in this case. Like we could have done quite a lot more, but I think that summary was good enough. Did you guys, how about you, Agent Ether? I see you looking at your paper. Well, I just wanted to mention in one of the interviews that I saw, they're, they're all artists. So they were going to school and one was like a painter and one was into pottery and one did uh, like mixed media. I don't know if you saw that. He had his master's in pottery, apparently. Mastery in pottery. <laughs> so, and they just did regular things. Like one painted landscapes and still lifes, and the other just did, you know, urns and pots. Nothing exciting. So apparently after this abduction, the big abduction, I, I actually didn't know about the childhood abductions, but after this, uh, what is it? The ab- Could you get closer to your mic there, Agent, either? But after the abduction, you're welcome. (laughs) The Allagash abduction, apparently their artwork all changed. One of them stated that he felt like he was being reprogrammed. And after, especially after the hypnotic regression, they would immediately go home and start to do their artwork as part of a way of remembering what had happened to them. And in one case, you had the artist who was painting still lifes. He went on to start making these folding paper patterns and he would make up these math patterns based on pi and then he would be painting them. And he said he felt like it was almost a compulsion, a compulsion to do art, to do this new kind of art. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then 
Another one of the interviewees, the abductee, said that he became obsessed with ancient temple architecture, and he was convinced that this ancient architecture was actually a map for microchip technology, like that it was a motherboard. Hmm. And, uh... Weird. weird. Yeah, so I found that highly interesting when, when I was watching these gentlemen. Towards the end of the interview it started to spiral out for me. So hmm. they kind of had me, I'm watching these different interviews. A lot of the stories are the same, but they vary in different ways. They seem to be getting more elaborate. But then, you know, they end on this note. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about this. You know, that just kind of seems a little off the deep end for me. There's, so there's... um a couple of so w- when you get an interview like this, they probably paid them, right? And I imagine that certain outlets, I'm not going to name names, but certain outlets seem to history en- channel encourage well, unsolved mysteries seem to encourage oh. witnesses, <laughs> particularly in UFO cases, to sort of embellish a little bit, maybe you know. And I wasn't there, I don't know that that happened for certain, but I have seen cases on unsolved mysteries where this sort of thing happens. So if yeah. you're paying your if you're paying somebody for an interview, you're going to want them to say something new that they didn't say in an interview that they did last year, for example. Otherwise, why would anybody want to watch it, you know? So there may have been sort of, you know, a gentleman's agreement to sort of embellish things. There may have been encouragement to do so. Perhaps, and, but I have to say as far as the pottery and paintings are concerned, you uh, can go to the website and you can see that artwork that mm-hmm. they did after their regression, et cetera. And it is, it is different, mm-hmm. you know, than, than what they were describing they used to do. And they had like pictures of some of the art that they used to do. And it was signed by them 73 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then they were comparing it to the artwork they were doing now, which was not only extremely different, but I felt was higher quality hmm. than what they were doing before. I mean, there could be something to it. But it, it could also be like the way things are edited and like, you know, we talked about before. I'm just playing a little devil's advocate, just to sort of a balanced approach. But I definitely, that definitely is suspicious to me when somebody, um, when they elaborate more and more over time where the story changes. But then again, I mean, that happens. Just like if you look at the Kenneth Arnold case, for example, his story was not 100% consistent either. There were minor discrepancies over time because, you know, if you tell the same story 10 times over, you're not going to tell it exactly the same time. You might remember a detail that you forgot to tell the last time, or you might say it from a slightly different perspective, you know, or you might describe something slightly differently. So that's not unusual at all for, you know, different interviews to be different. It just, it depends on how they embellish it. And I see what you're saying. Like when there's a certain flavor to invention, you know, versus somebody who's, telling a story and then they forgot to tell a particular piece of information that they left out. So they add that this time, or maybe they leave something out that they mentioned last time. It's some, it strikes you a little differently than somebody who's like making it up. You know, I have to say this though. The artwork was a lot different. I don't, I don't know if I'd call it good, especially the (laughs) illustrations, (laughs) Uh but uh, the the pottery was different. Yeah. You know, it, it definitely from what they were doing, what they were doing before. And and I did like some of the uh, the mathematical looking sort of paper folding um, illustrations that he was that he was talking about. I, I found those kind of interesting. I don't know that I'd hang it in my living room or anything, but I thought they were kind of neat to look at. Yeah. Yeah, I looked at a little bit of their art. I didn't have time to check out it. Much was of it was nothing but... earth shattering. Yeah. You know, I almost wish that it was. I, I would love to say I looked at this artwork and I was like, that's out of this world that they were inspired by, you know, a higher order mm-hmm. or higher being like, that would be really cool. That was not the impression I got looking at this artwork. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And, and the only reason why I would hang it on my wall is just because it's kind of nostalgic. You know what I mean? Like right. It's, it's related right. to this, this, this big case that I'm interested in and, and, you know, I find very interesting, you know, but like, yeah, that's the only reason why I'd, I'd hang it on the wall. It's not because it's high art, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. All right. So I I think we've gone over most of the particulars of the case. So now it's time for our opinions. I mean, what do you guys think? Would you guys, you guys 
think it's it happened? Do you th- guys think it's partially true? Maybe they made everything up? I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I'm a little bias. I've never been a huge, I'd like to say, fan mm-hmm. of alien abduction. Right. You know, when we talk about these cases and we talk about the sightings and the evidence and so forth, that that really interests me and that that grabs my attention. But these uh, abductee cases, I find a little hard to believe. So I, I'm yeah. I'm going in there a little biased. I'll admit. I think part of that, for me, anyways, is that it's so far removed from anything I've experienced in my own life. It's hard to put myself in that place, you know. But you should look into the. You weren't with us on the Betty and Barney Hill no. case. Like I don't know exactly what's what with that case, but I'm convinced something strange happened to those people. I I will say that I've seen a couple of movies with alien abductions, and they did freak me the hell out. So yes. there is that. What was oh, that sure. one? We watched where I remember at the the end was stupid because the kid like there's the walkie talkie and you could hear him talking over the walkie talkie to his yeah. brother. What was that called? Uh, I forget. It, the movie overall wasn't that good, but it had some very creepy moments. Yeah, very creepy moments. Uh, and and one scene, the mom goes into the room and out of the corner of her eye, it's like dark, and she sees this tall <laughs> figure. Yeah. So she turns around turns on the light, turns back, and her son's missing from the bed. Yeah. So then the house alarm goes off, and she finds him, like, outside staring up into the sky. So somehow he got out through the house, into the yard, like in the blink of an eye when she turned around to turn on the lights. Yeah. It's a quick quick kid. Yeah. Yeah, It's very agile. It's the flash, you know? It was so, oh, that whole movie. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. Ether had to sleep with the lights on that night. I did. That was really really scary. I didn't like it at all. Yeah. It was was pretty damn creepy. That's for sure. (laughs) Have you seen Fire in the Sky? I don't know. Have I? That's the, that's the movie they made about the Travis Walton abduction. Probably not. That was, that was in the nineties. It's, it was a decent movie. Yeah. It was was fun. It wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I get creeped out or should I see it? It was pretty creepy. It was pretty creepy. I mean, they, um, they since, well, it's not exactly what he reported happening, but they try to, they try to demonstrate what he was feeling on the screen, you know, with stuff that he didn't report happening, but it's pretty (laughs) creepy. Yeah. You know, yeah. Pretty damn creepy in some places. But Mm -hmm. yeah. How about you ETA? What do you think about this case? So my my opinion is uh, I'm all in. This all happened. There's absolutely no reason to uh, assume that it didn't happen. <laughs> uh, every single abduction that has ever happened is true. Um, no, I'm joking. So so I'm 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 on the fence a little bit about it. I lean towards believing them because I want to, to be quite honest. But like uh, this this case, like it's it's uh, it's compelling. There's no doubt about that. But I just don't, I, it's, I don't know which way to, to lean on this one. You know what I mean? Like it's, um, there's not quite enough. I, I, all the evidence that you have is basically them, their testimony. You I got to I mean? see, they, I got to say too, they didn't seem overly traumatized. And I, I know they've told their story at this point, probably dozens of times, but you're listening to these interviews and they just seem so flat to me. Hmm. You yeah. know, there's like an energy that's that's missing as they're yeah. talking. Um, all of them, all of them. There's not even one where I I felt uh, was was what's the word charismatic, I guess. Yeah, or com- or compassion. Compassion. You know? Yeah, I just yeah. I felt like it really lacked a depth of feeling that I would. I, I've I've seen some interviews um, from people that claim to have been abducted and like like. What they're like as they're sitting there, like describing their their story, like they they get brought to tears. You know, you can see like there there's extreme emotion involved with what they are they are describing. You know, right? And uh, that kind of stuff to me is is uh, maybe they're good actors. I don't know, but like you know, like uh, it, it, it's it's very compelling at the very least. You know, it's they 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 seem to be very genuine. And I'm speaking in generalities here now because there's so many different cases, right? But like, I've seen some interviews that really really compelled me towards believing what they're this person is saying yeah, as far as what they're claiming. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I didn't get that same feeling with these uh, interviews that I've seen with these guys. You know. Yeah, I, for me personally too, I'm I'm sort of w- with ETA here. I'm like on the fence. Like there's 
the story is very compelling, but I'm not like 100% convinced. I think it's possible that they did see something strange. Maybe they saw a UFO in the distance or something, and then it just sort of spun into this story over the years, you know, with retellings mm-hmm. and stuff. There are some it's details. Possible. There are some details. Like when, when they were, um, when they did the hypnosis, they did that separately and their stories matched except for Mr. Rack's story, which did have some differences, but yeah, I mean, but, but here's the thing. They, they had every opportunity to talk about this event before they went under hypnosis. They all right. agreed to do it. So it was 12 years I mean? later. Like, yeah. Yeah. It was 12 years later. And also they had ample time to talk about it beforehand. So they could have agreed upon a storyline that they all wanted to present or what have you, you know, like, yes, yeah. it's, it's it, it, know, it, if that would have happened like directly after like their, their quote unquote abduction event or what have you, then I'd be more convinced to believe them. But, you know, since it was uh, quite a bit later after what had happened, then I don't know, man, it's, it's a, uh, they could have all agreed upon like, you know, the story that they wanted to present. So I, I don't know. It's, it could be either way. I, I I could go either way on it. Like like I said, I want to believe, but I'm I'm not necessarily I'm not I'm not convinced. You know, I'm not I'm not convinced on on this story, you know, like uh it sounds very very grandiose, you know, and, and uh it, it's very similar to a lot of abduction stories that I've heard, but um I've seen other abduction stories, like I said, where the compassion involved and like how, how upset the person is while they're telling their story seems to convince me a little bit more. And yeah, that, for maybe, sure. maybe that's just, but, an, yeah. So like, um, like I was saying, like anecdotal, I, I'm you know? sort of on the fence on this one because there are details in the case. Like for example, the, the matching stories under hypnosis or even to a small extent, the polygraph tests, which are not really reliable, but uh, there's yeah. certain details like that that sort of pull me in and make me think, well, you know, this seems like this seems like there is something here, but then on the other hand, there are details that kind of be I don't know, it just it sounds like a science fiction story at the same time, you know, like yeah, it doesn't yeah. I don't know. So I'm on the fence on this one. I'm I'm not necessarily dismissing it, but I'm not necessarily all on board either. I think it I think yeah. it's a, a really interesting story. And if it is fake, well, it's like the they did a really good job of fabricating the story. But I sure, yeah. I think it's possible they could be that it could have be it could be real. I think it's possible it could be a hoax. I'm not really sure. I have no idea on this yeah. one. Well, it's like all the evidence that that I've seen here. It draws you in, then it draws you out, then it draws you back in. You know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. like, like I said, like, like I said, I want to believe, but like, you know, it, it's there are some red flags here. You know that like it's not necessarily. I, I'm not saying they're liars, but like it makes me kind of question. You know what's going on here. You know the 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 reality of the situation. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't. I guess like I, at the end of the day, like I said, like um, I'm lean, I'm on the fence, but I'm leaning towards them because you know. Uh, I mean, I don't know what what if this did happen. You know, like like mm-hmm. I keep on asking myself, like if this did happen, then I feel sorry for these people, man. Like like th- this is a very negative situation to go through. So like, you know, I don't want to call, I know I, I, I hate calling anybody's anybody liars. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm, I, I don't like doing that. Right. So I want to believe you, but sometimes there are some red flags. Like I said, that like make you question the situation and, and some situations like some UFO abductions that I've, you know, uh, done a little bit of research on and stuff and been interested in, uh, some of them are, you know, there are very little red flags. And like, and the thing is also like the story, like is the same the whole way through. You never see any deviation. You never see anything like added on to the fact the story is the story. And they keep on telling this individual that claims to be abducted, keeps on telling the same story over and over again without any discrepancies. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of stuff that like, I, I believe them when, you know, when, when, when it's a, that kind of a story, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, I guess that about wraps it up for this week's episode. Before we leave you here, I, well, hold on, let me hit the flag here. Make sure I can edit that out for our Patreon subscribers who get this ad free. Anyways, before we leave you here, I got an 
Amazon affiliate ad. This time around, we have the Workshop Precision Adjust Knife Sharpener. Now, this may seem like, sort of like a strange item, but actually, I bought this myself because I had some old kitchen knives. They're actually a pretty good brand. They're uh, Kershaw Shun, which is like, I think it's like a Japanese brand. They're not like super nice. They're not like super high end, but they're pretty damn decent and they get the job done. But they were in really bad shape, like really, really bad shape. And I needed a sharp. I gotten a couple of the other knife sharpeners in the past, like on the low, like $10 or $30, like lower end ones. And um, they ended up just making the knives worse. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't help the situation mm-hmm. at all. So I did a lot of reading well, and, about how to sharpen and some, knives. And it turns out you can't do it with like, with like, you know, your basic stuff. You really have to get like a, a whetstone basically. Yeah. What are you going to say, Agent uh, ETA? Uh, you cut out for a second, so I didn't, I didn't hear what you said. But like some, some of the knife sharpeners that I've seen, they'll sharpen it for a very short period of time, basically. Is, you know, like they'll yes. sharpen it. But but then like they get dull real fast. So there there's a very it's, it's a it's a finite like uh you know um I don't know what what to call it. Like it's like you have to sharpen a knife right in order to keep it sharp for a long period of time. Also that the knife needs to be of 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 a decent quality of metal too in order to keep it sharp. So if you have a cheap knife and you're trying to sharpen it, yeah, you can sharpen it, you know, and you can make it better than what it was, you know, if it's dull. But it's not going to keep that edge over a long period of time yeah. because it's just not made out of good metal. But if you do have a good knife and you sharpen it correctly, it'll it'll stay sharp for a decent amount of time. You know what I mean? Right. Depending on how much you're using it. Well, and what I like about this particular sharpener is that it ha- it's like a sort of a device that holds the knife and it allows you to set the angle so you can have repeatable results, basically. One of the hard things about using like a whetstone is you're doing it by hand. So, I mean, there are people who can do it very easily and very quickly, but there's a learning curve there. Whereas this thing, yeah, you just set it to 20 degrees or whatever it is, and you always get 20 degrees. There's like no learning curve yeah. whatsoever. It's very easy to use as far as these things go. And the results were surprisingly good. I, w- I took some old beat up knives that I thought I was basically going to have to throw out, and now they are razor sharp. So they're, mm-hmm. I-, I was actually so impressed with the results on this product, I'm like, I'm going to use this on my next episode. Cause you know, why not? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. I was like, what is that noise? Well, that's, that's uh, Asian ether is kissing one of our cryptids. He's uh, oh. yeah, they're, they're cutie pies. All right. Well, they, 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 they deserve it. You know, like one of the things I, I always like say about dogs, a good dog is uh, they're too good for us. You yeah. know, like, like we don't deserve them necessarily, you know? Oh, but, like, trust it's, me. It's, that's uh, what he thinks. He's, all alpha. Yeah. Well, well yeah, hey, this yeah. dog's this dog's oh, yeah. hilarious. But all right. So <laughs> link link in the description. The workshop prison adjust prison <laughs> workshop prison precision adjust and precision adjust elite. The difference between the two sets is that the elite has um, more more uh, grits to choose from, as far as I can tell. Just you know, more different polishing options. But they're essentially the same thing. But look, check them out. Links in the description. And uh, yeah, affiliate link, your purchase helps support the show and doesn't cost you anything extra. And I guess that's all we got for you this week. Keep it strange. Strange as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you should definitely keep that in. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm keeping that for sure. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what went on.